recognize my wife, Carol. <laughs> Today, Linda, one of our 18. <laughs> well, I want to thank all the veterans for coming. This is a real honor for you to come and share this time with us. Thank you very much. Also, um, I want to thank Justin for the introduction. You know, I met Justin a couple years ago. He was a state rep, and they, uh, somebody came and told me that. You know, he votes a lot like you do. Sometimes he'll vote all by himself. <laughs> Man, I'm friends of mine. Yeah. 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 And that's what has to happen. A revolution is going on, there's no doubt in my mind. It's an intellectual revolution. It's not brand new, but it's a refinement of our original revolu resolution, uh, revolution. And we're going to build on that. We're going to build on the cause of, of, of freedom. But when this revolution, you know, uh, is totally successful, it will permeate all of society. Just as the liberalism permeated both the Democratic and Republican society, and we all became Keynesians, uh, this, this uh, movement is going to go to the point where all, we're going to have a time when we can say we're all Austrian free market economists. right now our vehicle is a particular election going on and it's in the Republican primary and a very powerful message can be uh, sent by winning this election. Now um, we're, you know, in the, if you look at the evening news you'll say, well, too bad, he doesn't show up here, they don't even list his name, these things. But right now we are second in numbers of delegates actually committed. really important and in some states they're still trying to figure out how to count the popular <laughs> but uh, our organization is uh, doing doing the job is necessary and working through the process which I hope can happen here in uh, Michigan as well but I'm excited about what's happening because the country has certainly changed in the last five years I believe it has changed for the better the number of people now waking up both young and old and saying enough is enough it really shows that the country is way ahead of Washington. Washington is still sound asleep. Now, let me tell you, they don't know you exist out there. That's our job, and that's why a good showing and winning an election and doing well in these primaries is so important. We need to wake up Washington, D.C., for they're sound asleep, and they need to hear our message loud and clear. started in politics back in the 1970s because some of the predictions made by those Austrian free market economists came, yeah. came about in 1971 when it was predicted that the pseudo gold standard established in 1945 at Bretton Woods would not work because it still allowed our government to spend too much and print too much money and they could not honor the commitment of, of the gold standard of $35 an ounce. So in a, in a way, on August 15, 1971, it was the initial stage of the declaration of uh, insolvency or bankruptcy of this country. Now, we've, we've lingered for a long time, and we have perpetuated and propagated the system we have, but all it has done is perpetuate debt. Now, because the debt has been allowed to build up, and it's not just domestic debt, it's worldwide debt, is we now are in the biggest debt crisis in the history of the world. And it's been perpetuated by the dollar standard, this ability for us to issue the reserve standard of the world and live off that. But economic law is more powerful than governments, and, and this system will change uh, because they can't stop it. So, but. Although this was known for many years that it was coming and the 1971 announcement was, was uh, well known and the bubbles that have been formed over these last 40 years, that has all been known. But we seem to struggle and get out of the recessions and depressions that we've had, but it's always been with more spending, more debt, more inflation until we got to the point where the debt was un uncontrollable and unsustainable. 
Today, there's a, there's a semblance of prosperity in this country, though the unemployment rate is much higher than the government will admit. Uh, there's a semblance of prosperity, but it's all based on debt. And this is why uh, the debt crisis is at our doorstep. If you look at the debt per GDP, our debt is bigger GDP-wise than the Greek debt. That's how serious it is. We literally own, our, you know, our national debt is $16 trillion. We owe foreigners $3 trillion. And what are we doing? We're adding at least $1.5 trillion every year to the debt. And what do they, what do, they do in the Congress? What do they do? Uh, they, they twiddle their thumbs. They, they say, oh yeah, we're worried about it. But you know what they don't do? They never cut anything. They only raise more. You have to cut the spending, and that's the reason I say the first year we should cut the spending by one trillion dollars. A, a lot of people worry about cutting a trillion dollars and it might hurt the economy. But it isn't so much spending the money, who gets to spend the money? If there's a trillion dollars floating around being spent, wouldn't it be much better if you got to spend your own money and not the government and the bureaucrats? A lot of people come up to me and they worry about it and ask me about it on TV and constantly and say, you know, the Keynesian notion is if you get into trouble from spending too much, the answer is spend more. And uh, so they say, wouldn't this be a terrible time? And even Bernanke, can you remember that guy's name? Yeah. Bernanke. He, he has been challenging me, not by name, of course, but he said, these people, whoever they are, maybe somebody in here, these people who say that we have to cut spending in the midst of a recession, this is very, very dangerous. You can't do that. But the question is only who, who, who quits the spending. If we get to quit, Cut the, spend the money instead of the government, that makes all the difference in the world. But the, 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 real, the only way this can come about is we have to address a very important subject, and that is what the founders asked ask themselves, and they had a revolution, wrote a constitution, what should the role of government be? That's really the question. Should we, should we have endless spending and, and entitlement system and endless wars? Or should the federal government and directly under our Constitution be meant to do one very important thing, and that is to protect your individual liberty, your right to your life? years, I would say we have really slipped dramatically away, and we're at a crisis point now. But something really important has happened approximately five years ago when, it, when the financial crisis hit. Most Americans woke up to this. Congress, like I say, they're not awake yet, but the American people woke up and they know there's something very serious going on. And also, during this period of time, the American people, by a large majority, have now come to run to the point of saying, these wars that we're fighting in the Middle East and around the world make no sense whatsoever. The policy of the Constitution, the advice of the founders, say that we should not get involved in entangling alliances nor on the internal affairs of other nations. And uh, yet, that, that is all that we have been doing, getting more and more involved. But if that is not our role, what should the foreign policy be? It should be a friendship and trade with people. Sure, there's some bad people out there, but when we're a perfect nation and set a perfect example for the world, then maybe we can do some talking. But to, quite frankly, if we have a perfect nation here, or a much better nation that is prosperous and free and safe and sound money, Maybe, just maybe, the other countries would want to follow us and we wouldn't have to try to force other people to live like we do. About a hundred years ago, especially in the time of Woodrow Wilson, we came up with some very bad ideas. And, uh, and, and we've been suffering ever since. So the stage was being set 
for ushering in the age of big government, the undermining of the currency, the change in foreign policy. It was Woodrow Wilson said, it is our moral obligation to make the world safe for democracy. And look how many people have died. I mean, you have these World War I and II and Korea and Vietnam and the Middle East and, all, and constant. Nobody can even absolutely know exactly how many countries that we have troops in. It's at least 135, 140. We have 900 uh, bases around the world and we're still building them. So this, this whole idea that we have to do this is, is, is such a dangerous economic idea because, you know, in the last 10 years, these wars have, have caused us to accumulate $4 trillion additional of debt because of these wars. And quite frankly, I do not feel safer because of it. I feel more in danger because of it. dangerous ideas that came out of the depression was that, well, first off, uh, the depression was, was uh, blamed by so many of the left. They said, well, it came because we had too much free markets and the gold standard, and that's what caused the depression. And then they claimed, and they're still teaching this in the schools, and they're still said, well, we finally got out of the depression when a war came. And there's some who actually believe that if you have war, you can get out of a depression. War is never an economic benefit to anybody. It is a cost. The only argument they can use is there's less unemployed, but uh, being unemployed is not quite as bad as you know going overseas and, and dying for some reason that is not uh, important to our national defense. So this is um, this is the crisis that we have have faced that we've overextended ourselves and we have to make this decision. For me, it's very simple. We should mind our own business and just come home. constitutional argument and couldn't convince the other candidates but I tried the economic argument and indeed there is a strong economic argument if you even ignore the other arguments which should be enough but the economic argument is so vivid when you think about the uh, Soviet Empire they collapsed because they were so foolish as to invade and occupy a country like Afghanistan can you imagine <laughs> The cost is a heavy burden, and that's how most empires come down, not by a military conflict. We did not have to fight the Soviets. They had 30,000 nuclear missiles and weapons, and they could, could have hit, hit us. They, uh, they had uh, missiles in Cuba. That was in 1962. That was the year I was drafted uh, in, into the Air Force. But today, today we seem to have this burning desire by a small minority in Washington who are able to convey through the media and the propaganda, this war propaganda, that we have to go to war against the country that doesn't even have a nuclear weapon and might not get one, but they said they could, so therefore we have to go to war. And of course, this is the, the drumbeat of war, how it once occurred against Iraq, all based on falsehoods and disinformation. And, and we go there and find out, well, they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Now we've turned that country over to uh, the Shiites who are allies with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the Iranians. And at the same time, uh, we, we, com we continue to pursue this at, uh, at, at great risk. But we're, we're now doing the same thing with the Iranians. The war drums are beating. And every single day, it's war propaganda. We are not under a threat by the Iranians. If the Soviets weren't enough to you know, have a conflict with them when they had so much in the height of the Cold War, this whole idea that we have to have another war, it will bring us down financially. And we have to wake up and tell our representatives, we don't need another war. We need less war.
people do, I certainly do, and, and we have trouble with our prosperity now, we have a recession, that peace brings more prosperity than war does. And that is why we should have a policy of seeking peace and, and not war. And then maybe we will get back on our feet again and spend money more wisely. But the, the uh, conditions under which we live today, whether it's the war conditions of what's going on overseas or the post 9-11 atmosphere, we live in very difficult times because they were able to use 9-11 as, as a tool for doing things that they had already planned to do. The war against Iraq had been planned before 9-11, and it was used as an opportunity. The first speech I ever gave against the war in Iraq was in 1998, because those, that's when the drums started beating. But on 9-11, they said, this is our chance that we can go in. But what else did they do? What was the first law they passed after 9-11? A bill that had been floating around for years, but they couldn't get the American people to endorse it and go along with it, so they put the Patriot Act up. It was a revised version of what they had. It was on the floor for an hour or so, and then there was a vote, and it was overwhelmingly supported. But uh, you know what we should do with the Patriot Act? We need to get rid of it. That's yeah. right. sitting next to another member and he was voting for it and um, I said why are you voting for this I said you know you don't you haven't had a chance to read it. He said, oh I know I said you know there's going to be some really bad stuff in here he said well I know that and I said well why are you voting for it he says how can I vote against the Patriot Act under conditions of post 9-11 he says how would I explain it to my people back home I said I don't know but I believe that's your job to go home and tell them why you're the opportunity in the near future of, uh, of, of getting rid of the Patriot Act. We shouldn't name it repealing the Patriot Act. We should call it Restore the Fourth Amendment Act. That's what I want. change with, uh, with no need to go to a, to a judge or a proper method to get a search warrant. There's no privacy left. The government's getting more secret. The whistleblowers get in prison. There's more secrecy now, and there's less privacy. The Constitution and the founders wanted us to have our privacy and no secrecy in the government. So we have to reverse it back to this time that we have transparency and we could start with transparency of the Federal Reserve. Oh. Restore, uh, you know, repeal the fourth, repeal the um, Patriot Act. We'll call it restore the Fourth Amendment. People will get the message then. But the atmosphere is is uh, is not good. If war times, there's more abuse of civil liberties. But now we're told we're in perpetual war, war forever, any place in the country. It's a war against potential terrorism, and they can't define terrorism. Terrorism is still defined in a dictionary, in our code, an international code, as a criminal act. But now we have drones all over the world. We bomb any spot that we want, and then we wonder why we have enemies around us wanting to do us harm. We invade their countries. We occupy their countries. There's a lot of collateral damage and people die and uh, then they wonder why uh, they might be annoyed and then I imagine a few of you heard uh, the result of the, the response at one of the debates when I suggested why don't we think about foreign policy with a golden rule attached to it was much more favorable than I got that. <laughs> so why, why shouldn't we look at it that way? Why should we do anything to another country that we would be furious that they did, to, did it to us? And the other thing is, though, when, when we go and uh, set the stage for another war and we put on sanctions on a country like uh, Iran, you know what it does? It solidifies support for their dictator. You know, there are a lot of dissenters in Iran that like to change it. 
But there's a nationalistic spirit which is natural to a country just as we came together on 9-11. On we think the outsiders are coming in, we're going to come together. But uh, we continue to do that. Just think of the sanctions on Cuba. For 40, 50 years, the sanctions have been on Cuba. The Castros are still there. You know, I think it's time to start talking to the Cubans and trading with them and, and celebrating. <laughs> But Justin mentioned the National Defense Authorization Act, and that is indeed there. So what they're saying now is that there is no, uh, they repealed posse comitatus. Now the military can arrest for civil, civil problems and, and enforcement of any law. But the worst part about this is they can arrest any American for any reason without any charges and deny an attorney, no court, no trial, and put in a secret prison. I mean, this is not what America is supposed to be about. And I cannot see how we can survive this country if that doesn't get out on the table. And just think, how many times have you heard it? There's 22 debates. How many times did it come up? It was barely a mention when I brought it up. But no challenge on civil liberties or, or, or this uh, abuse of liberties by our executive branch. So this is, uh, this is a, a major problem for us. And uh, also the um, president, a year ago now, uh, February of last year, he unilaterally said that um, the president, uh, because he's the commander in chief, he can assassinate American citizens. I mean, oh. where, 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 did, where did this come from? You know, in the National Defense Authorization Act, they use the term associated forces. Those are the people that are associated with problems. That makes it a, a legitimate target. So you might say, oh, well, that's okay. That means just if you're a really bad guy or you're dealing with a bunch of criminals, then they, you're an associated force. But in this day and age, an associated force might be donating money to a group. You might not know exactly how they spend the money. It might be visiting a website. It might be getting emails. It might be t attending a, men, a, a, a meeting. What if you happen to go to a meeting and the meeting is mainly designed to uh, preach a, a message about more peace and less war? That might make you a subversive. The fact that you can be arrested is just an outrage. The worst criminals in the world have been given trials. Well, Saddam Hussein even had a trial, you know. Um, Adolf Eichmann got a trial. The war, the war criminal, Nazi war criminals got a trial. Uh, Timothy McVeigh got a trial. But now to assume that without charges even made that we can do this. This is a very serious uh, infraction about what we're supposed to be all about. But there are other things that have been challenging to our civil liberties too. And it's another war that is a, more of a domestic war, but it's a vicious war too on our liberties. Of course, by many, endorsed by many for good intentions, but it's been 40 years now that they've been fighting this modern day war on drugs. It doesn't work. We ought to give up on that. It, it's, you know, that whole thing comes from the fact that people don't understand what right to life and right to liberty means. People say, you know, that, uh, you know, we do have freedom of religion to make our own very important decisions about our religious and spiritual values. And we're still allowed to read some controversial books. You can go to the library and read about communism and, and, and very, very dangerous religious and, and, uh, and political philosophies that literally led to killing of millions of people. But we're allowed to do that. But... What, one thing that you're not allowed to do is put into your body at will whatever you want to. You have to be ask the government what you can do. They're even to the point where you're not even allowed to drink raw milk unless the federal government tells you you're allowed to drink raw milk. <laughs> So this, this, uh, this represents the fact that they do not have the same understanding of liberty as you and I would have. That it's your life. Yes, you might abuse it. You should suffer the consequences if you don't take care of yourself. That's what it's about. economics, if you don't do a good job and you uh, overextend yourself and you get into trouble, you certainly shouldn't get a bailout from the U.S. government. Woo! The worst part about the monetary system that encouraged a lot of people to make a lot of money, 
that is not market oriented, rich people are fine with me. The richer the better if they've done a good job in delivering to the consumer a good product and we made them rich because we like their product and they didn't commit any, uh, any fraud and they didn't get any benefits from the taxpayer, yes. They, they get voted uh, rich because we buy their products. But unfortunately today, the very rich on Wall Street are benefiting from a monetary system which serves their interests. Just the destruction of money, the devaluation of currency, the systematic undermining of our dollar requires that a transfer of wealth will leave the middle class and go to the very select few. And that's been going on a long time. But just think of what happened when the crisis hit. They got the bailout, and the middle class got the debt. We ended up owning the debt, all the derivatives. And you know what they're preparing to do right now? They're preparing for us to have the European debt dumped on us, the Greek debt and others. They're dumping that debt on us. And, uh, of course, done in secret, I'm doing my very best. I will have a much better opportunity as president to root out the evil. Jefferson argued the case uh, at the time of uh, the writing of our Constitution that uh, we should not be able to borrow money. He lost that argument, unfortunately, so uh, we, we didn't have an income tax. They didn't give us that. That came later. But uh, the, the fact that we ended up with an income tax and borrowing money, it still wasn't enough. It wasn't deceitful enough. People could figure it out because taxes could go too high and the people would rebel. Then borrowing was a delayed payment, borrowed and pay the debt later on, and uh, that, that could carry over for a while. But then they had to have this idea of just creating new credit out of thin air, uh, printing, printing the money. And some people suffered more than others. Certainly the middle class suffered, and while others were benefited, whoever gets to spend the money first benefits the most. So this, this, was, this was automatic. It was automatic that under these conditions government would grow. We would, we would have an entitlement system because that's how politicians buy votes. And then we would have a, a wartime system, a warfare system, where we could borrow and print and, and spend money uh, around the world. And this would go on for a long time. But it's ending, and that's what we're facing today. And the American people are waking up, and uh, certainly in the last five years, more and more people have become aware of this. So this is the very good news. And the very good news also is the fact that a couple groups are coming together and joining us in this effort. There's a group that I like to think about as being a remnant of society that always clung to the truth and knew about it, frustrated at no end because they got disgusted with voting either party, same old story, promise one thing, one party says we'll end the war and protect your civil liberties, they do nothing but make it worse. Another party says we believe in balanced budgets and cut the spending and they do nothing but spend even more money and double the size of the Department of Education, expand government health, health benefits. So they got disgusted and they more or less dropped out and there were some, I meet them along the way, they, they've never been involved. I mean, they've been looking at this for a long time and they're disgusted, but now, because they're recognizing what's going on and the message of liberty is coming out loud and clear, they're starting to join us now and becoming politically active, and I think that's great news. and coming out, and that is the, not the next generation, the young generation today, love the message of liberty, and they are coming out and they are supporting this Is uh, how we get our message out because it's not going to be on the evening news. How many times? How many? How many of you ever heard anything about the National Defense Authorization Act and the arresting of American citizens? You don't hear that on the evening news, but we do have something very, very important to us, and I think it's fantastic, and that is the internet. That's where. The Act. And this was an attack on the, on, on the internet. But guess what? Because you heard about it and got upset about it, many, many who had signed on and were co-sponsors, they took their name off and those bills were removed both from the House floor and the Senate floor.
wireless minority get noisy enough, we can have an effect, and that was a good example. But we cannot be complacent because they're already trying to go around us, and they think they can do it by treaty. The president now has a treaty. He's trying to get the Senate to sign on where they will have control of the Internet. Let's hope that the Internet, I don't understand all the details of the Internet, but I hope it's bigger than any government there is. I hope they can always get around. relatively new idea and I think uh, young people are attracted to new ideas but a lot of people will accuse me and I'm sure you've been accused of saying oh you believe in gold standard you believe in laissez-faire capitalism private properties and and this sort of thing and they uh, they would say you're just going back back to 19th century or so but you know what you know what is really old and that is tyranny and that's what we got today and indirectly we're moving in that direction because uh, our society is getting to be where the tyrant is the dictatorship of the majority and they can get around to uh, abuse the minority and they do so uh, this is this has been here for a long time but we've had this experiment and it was great success it was imperfect but we still had the freest and the most prosperous country ever the largest middle class and from my viewpoint, it looked to me like we were throwing it away. Throwing away this tremendous experiment, but right now, I'm more encouraged than ever because I think America is waking up and they know the other. For practical reasons, some, are th some of us are theoretical and say, well, we just believe in liberty and this is what our goal should be and this is a natural consequence. But many others are waking up because whether they're on the receiving end or the paying end, they're waking up and saying, it doesn't work anymore and we're broke and they're admitting the truth. That means they're looking at our views because they can't offer any more, uh, you know, big government program. The 20th century, uh, was the, the age of what was a decade or a, a century where socialism was proved to be at great fault. And I would like to see as quickly as possible in the next decade the proof pudding that interventionism, the planned economy, the uh, paper money system, and this uh, economic planning through monetary policy, all this is failing too. It, it's supposed to be a soft sell on socialism and welfareism, but the truth is it's still authoritarianism. It doesn't recognize the value of your life and your liberties, and this is the message that we have to get across because it will give us the peace and prosperity that we all seek. Yeah. several pieces, uh, economic liberty and personal liberty, and they were thought to be two different things. And even today, some people say, well, he's an economic conservative and he believes in the free market. Somebody else say, he's a civil libertarian, he believes in personal liberties. But there should be no difference. If you have a right to your life and a right to your liberty, you ought to have a right to the keep your fruits of labor, liber, um, fruits of your labor. This is all one thing. But a lot of people get sort of hesitant you know, the ones on the left will say, yeah, that's good, but there's still going to be a poor person out there and we have to help them. So they embark on a system that makes sure that a few people get benefits, but before they know it, the rich get the benefits and the poor get the crumbs. And they, and they uh, keep, keep saying that uh, if, we, if we take care of these people, or, so we're going to have programs of free education, free medical care, free housing, and, and, and all of a sudden if we wake up, the people who got the free housing essentially, don't get very, they lose their houses. The medical care goes downhill. The educational system goes downhill. And the young people get nothing but debt. So there, there is a point where the people realize that this doesn't work. And I think that's where, uh, that's where we are today. And that's why we need more confidence in this understanding of what liberty is all about. Others on the other side, uh, one would say that about economic liberty. On, on the other side, they say, yeah, but if we give people too much freedom, they're going to abuse it, and they're going to do things that aren't very wise, which is absolutely true. Some will. 
but do you think things are better off if your personal lifestyle are dictated by the politician and the bureaucrats that you know and that the world would be better if we didn't make the choices and let the bureaucrats make choices for our personal habits and our personal life? I don't buy into that. I don't think we should let them do it either. is that people people think if they have too much too much uh, liberty they're going to do things that uh, you know that they frown upon but it is true if you accept liberty for yourself you have to accept liberty for other people because they may use it they may not be frugal they may not do a very good job they should you know benefit if they take care of themselves and suffer the consequences if they don't in a free and prosperous society there will be more wealth there will be less poor people we so often lose the argument about uh, the humanitarian argument. To me, the only humanitarian system that you can have is a free market, sound money system. Because if if you think humanitarianism can be forced on our throats and you have more prosperity, uh, then we're kidding ourselves. But on the, on the issue of uh, on, on personal liberty and, and habits, you say, well, as long as that individual who's exercising their rights run their own life and they don't hurt other people, yeah, you have a right to, to try to change things. The first thing, you have responsibility for yourself to take care of the way you want to live, to set an example. Then you have family and friends and neighbors and churches and communities to try to change things. But to turn this over to the federal government means that the federal government is going to take away uh, and steal, steal your liberties. Once a government embarks on this notion that they can protect you from yourself, there is no liberty left. It doesn't mean you endorse what they do. You know, if you have freedom of religion, some people have religions you think are rather bizarre. Some people don't even practice a religion. You might say you do. You don't You don't lay awake at night, you know, worrying about that. At the same way about reading books or, or whatever. But if you, if you see this and you can tolerate other people who are different, you know what happens is we all come together. We come together not because... because we're individuals, we want to make up our own decisions, and then we tolerate other people's views. And like I say, as long as people don't use their violence and try to force things on other people. Governments shouldn't force you, individuals shouldn't force each other. But this is the reason that the true example of liberty brings very, very diverse groups together. And another thing, if we want to understand this, we have to realize that we don't get our rights because we belong to a group. It's all, it sounds good and you know, we talk about civil liberties and minority rights and women's rights and all kinds of rights and sexual rights. I don't think, I don't think you need to do anything. I think that's confrontational. I think what you need to do is think of individuals' rights to do what they want with their lives. to study it and understand it. I think it's relatively new, like I say. But we can improve on it. We don't have to go back to an old gold standard. We can improve on another gold standard. It wasn't perfect. But the ultimate test of this is what the founder said. It ultimately, it depends on the morality of the people. Nobody's going to... Freedom doesn't work if the people aren't willing to accept the principles of freedom and assume responsibility for themselves. If they think that all we have to do is get together and hire more lobbyists, see, the business community are the most guilty right now because they have spent more money on lobbying than they do on R&D, and they want to influence government. And, and so we, if we had this confidence, uh, it would complete, be completely different. We'd have a very small government. We would have a strong national defense. We would be tolerant of other people. We would have a lot more freedom. We would have a lot more prosperity. And one thing for sure, we would have a lot more peace in the world. And those are my goals, peace and prosperity. Thank you.